Okay, hello. Um, so this is going to be um, a lot of fun. So it's the end of the day, the first day of uh, uh, NDC, and uh, I'm sure you've gotten your head filled with different ideas and new technologies that you can't wait to try. Um, but I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that they put me at the end of the day. Um, not so happy they put me at the second talk of my first day. Um, but it's all about having fun, and, and, I, and my goal is that on Monday, when you go back to work, or maybe Saturday and Sunday, if, if you write on the weekends, write code on the weekends, you will think about code differently. But I'm going to make an assumption, which I'm actually going to confirm right now. How many of you are .NET developers? OK, um, pretty much everyone. And are you C Sharp developers? Is that a fair statement? Most everyone? A couple of shaking their hands like this. Um, would you consider yourself full stack? C Sharp developers, meaning that you know some T-SQL, you know a bunch of C Sharp, and you have to know some JavaScript. Is that a fair statement? Not as many hands. OK. Um, this talk is really designed for those people who raise their hand when they said they're C Sharp developers, um, and they're possibly full stack. One last question before we start. How many work in an organization that do test-driven development, TDD? OK, eh, 30. A lot of people are doing this, if you, you can't see. <laughs> You're supposed to be doing test-driven development, but it's not maybe working out the way you want. Um, ultimately, my goal is to allow you to perhaps work in a test-driven development shop, but write code a little bit differently. And my goal is, like I said, to think about code differently to make you more productive and more effective on Monday. That, that's my primary goal, so immediate impact in what you're doing. But because it's the end of the day and we're having fun, and um, we're going to start with a story. So I don't know if this manages your expectations, but I'm going to give you a story for about 20 minutes about the Wright brothers, actually more about Wilbur Wright. Uh, and then we're going to jump over, and I'm going to do a whole bunch of code. I'm going to do live code um, without a net in front of NDC. I might be crazy, but that's what we're going to do. So just managing your expectations. And it's the first time I've ever used a clicker like this, so I'm very excited. Um, so here's the story. In May of 1899, this guy, Wilbur Wright, was in Dayton, Ohio, and he sat down at his desk in that house and wrote that letter to the Smithsonian Institution. Now, at the time, the Smithsonian Institution was the place for scientific knowledge in the United States of America, one of the repositories in the world, in fact. And in the letter, it's a great letter, it's short, you should read it um, if you have a chance. He said, I'm interested in heavier than air than flight. I'm not a crank. I, I've known the past people who've tried so far. I'm aware uh, of what's going on. Can you just please send me all the information? What struck me most about that letter was this line. I'll do it my part time. True story. Um, about three years earlier, this guy, Samuel Langley, who ironically was in charge of the Smithsonian that Wilbur had written to, he was the most prominent scientist in the United States because he was in charge of the Smithsonian, where he was, he was prominent. And he was interested in heavier than air flight, too. So three years before Wilbur even thought about getting information about heavier than air flight, he went ahead and created a half-size model, an MVP, if it were, of heavier than air flight. That thing, and this is actually this photograph, was taken by Alexander Graham Bell, a friend of Langley. Langley had high friends and friends in high places. Um, and so the guy who invented the telephone, good friend, goes out on his rowboat, takes a picture of that half-size model. And that thing flew for two minutes, world record. And Langley th said, this is great. I flew something for two minutes. All I needed to do is make it a little bit bigger, one feature ad, make the engine a little bit stronger to carry the extra weight, second feature ad, and I could put a human on it, ship it. So Langley said, OK, I can do that, but I need a little bit of money. So he calls up his buddy. Well, maybe he talked to his buddy. Anyone know who that is? Roosevelt, that's right. Oh, I don't have candy anymore. Oh, well, I'll hit you up later. That's Teddy Roosevelt. At the time, he was the secretary of um, the Navy. And Teddy Roosevelt, this time, was very interested in war and, and you know, bombing our enemies in the United States. And, and Langley said, you give me some cash, I'll make sure you have a military weapon that no one else in the world can have. Seriously. And, and Roosevelt said, that's a cool idea. I'll give you 50 grand. Or he got the war department to give him 50 grand. Took a couple years to go. And 50 grand annual, if you index that to, an, oh my gosh, you're right, that is loud. If you index that to inflation, it's really not that much. It's like two, two to three million dollars. 
But at the time, that was the largest amount of money the United States government had given to any scientific endeavor. So it was huge, and the, and the press thinking it's a boondoggle for heavier than flight, air flight, which is going against the laws of Newton. No one should be doing it. Okay, so now we have Langley. Three-year head start, 50 grand in the bank. He actually had 20 more he could bill on. In 1903, in December, Langley had the first chance. He spent the time, built his little bit bigger, a little bit stronger engine. And I don't know if you can tell by this picture, but it's already sort of pointing down. Um, uh, and yeah, and the reason he launched over water is because it's, he was kept crashing, and if it hit the ground, like earth, it would break apart so the water was better. Anyway, it was going down, completely wipes out. A couple of days, uh, maybe a week later, he tries again. This time it goes up, and then goes down. And then he couldn't convince the guy who was flying it to go anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, about two weeks later, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, Wilbur and his brother, Orville, launched, did four, t four times, first heavier than air flight, controlled it in flight. The first one was about a minute. After that, they just kept going and going and going. So my question is, why did the Wright brothers succeed part-time, no money, and Langley, a lot of head start, a lot of money, almost there? He had a half-size model working. Why didn't he succeed? And to that, I wanted to go to this guy. Uh, he's a guy named Jeff Sutherland. And 70 years later, after the Wright brothers flew, he was actually flying jet airplanes, which is kind of amazing. You think about what within, 30, within 70 years, we're on the moon and we're flying jet aircraft. So, but that's not why we know him. We know him because he, and along with a bunch of other his friends, um, all middle-aged white guys, went to Snow, uh, Snowbird and wrote the Agile Manifesto. And I'm sure, uh, I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with the Agile Manifesto, test-driven development. Right, TDD, some of you are raising your hands. And these people, Uncle Bob's up there and, and Andy Hunt and all those guys, they had sort of different specialties. Um, and Sutherland, now he's down there in the middle bottom, he was a scrum guy with a couple other people. And he wrote this book called Scrum, Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. I read that book right after I read David McCullough's uh, The Wright Brothers book. And I said, you, you, the, the parallels between these two books is so crazy. There, there, there's so much there that I want to look at it. And then I thought, and the interesting thing is, Sutherland is talking about Scrum, about organizing teams outside of software development, like building airplanes. It has directly application to software development, but not just in teams, but about the way we write our code. I hope to prove that to you. It's a bit of a leap, kind of an ambitious talk, but that's what I'm going to try to prove to you. So let's start with the easy stuff. Oh, yeah, so he's our moderator, Sutherland versus Langley versus Wright. So Sutherland says, number one, you need a small team. So Langley gets his money. The first thing he does, oh, yeah, and by the way, Langley, I'm going to put this up there often. He was almost there. He had the MVP. Two feature ads, boom, he's, he's shipping. Um, Langley actually hired some of the best people in the world at the time to work on his project. At the time, the team probably grew max to 20. I, I couldn't quite tell. I didn't go that deep into Langley's um, day to day. Um, and, and in and of itself, is 20 too big or too small? I don't know. I do know that Langley was steeped in the Industrial Revolution, and every comment or quote about him as a manager is basically he's a horrible human being. Um, like, if you worked for him, you had to take two steps behind him as he walked down the hall type stuff. And I don't think that's atypical. I don't mean to, you know, like, this historical revision on the guy. Um, but that's the way he sort of approached his group. And he said, look, Half-size model, just make it bigger, bigger engine, get it working. And they said, sure, boss, we got that. Wilbur, on the other hand, in total, at any point in time, two and a half, maybe three people. You know his brother, Orville, and you also a guy named Charlie Taylor, who actually built the engine for him. And that's it. Wilbur was much more hands-on, um, working, 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 very small team. And, um, and, and that's so Sutherland's telling you that you needed a small team, probably... That's one reason why. It was just a couple of small, motivated individuals working extremely hard. But the other thing that's really interesting to me is that Sutherland tells you you should do one thing at a time only. Think about that when you're writing code. Langley, oh, and at the time, at the time, the most, 
the, the most prominent person who was doing ideas about heavier than air flight or human powered flight or gliding as it were, this guy, his name is Otto Lilienthal. They would make a glider and they'd fly a couple feet off the ground. Then they'd make a little bit bigger glider and fly a couple more feet off the ground. And you can see a picture of the church steeple right there. He got about to about 50 feet off the ground before he crashed and died. And that's not atypical of what the glider folks were doing. Most people before the Wright brothers were bigger and bigger and bigger. Then they'd finally get up high enough, look, I'm flying, boom. So Langley said, okay, so here's the problem. I need to get up in the air and I have to do it often. I have to be up in the air a lot so I can first, and so I can figure out this control thing, right? Because you can't really replicate it on the ground. So what do I need? I need a big engine to put on my half-size model. And so that's what he spent a majority of his time doing. Wilbur, on the other hand, said, you know what? That's not the problem, a bigger engine. What you really need is to figure out the gliding, the control in flight. Because there's always a breeze, and breezes are free. It's open source. Um, and so if you can figure out how to control yourself in flight uh, bigger and bigger than Leventhal, you're done. Then we can just throw a smaller motor on it and get it going. Wilbur has a famous quote, I don't know if you're familiar, that he said, you know, there's two ways to learn about a, riding a horse. You either sit on the fence and watch, or you get on the horse and sometimes get bucked off. So his idea was, I need to be on the horse as often as possible. I don't have any money for an engine to keep me up there, so I'm going to use the breeze, and I'm going to figure out the balance first. Langley knew about the balance problem. He had no way of controlling the airplane, but he's like, I need to get up there with that engine before I can start worrying about control. If Langley decided to work on the control thing first, maybe he would have actually won. But it was that sort of, I don't know if it's by chance, but it was a rational decision that actually wound up wrong. So maybe you also have to be lucky at times too. Incremental small changes. Anyone want to guess what this is? What are they? Number of races. Number of races? Releases. That's exactly right, Jan. That is the number of times they tried to do anything after they got the money and they started. And there's two things I want to point out. Oh, I don't have a laser pointer. So the, I'll, I'll do it on the screen here. The first is right here. Uh, so w Wilbur and Orville go out to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, October of 1900, and they build their first glider, and it works pretty well. They say, okay, we got it. They go back home to Dayton. They build their bigger and better. They go out to Ch Kitty Hawk, 1901. They do it through July and August, or August and September. And things didn't work out as well as they wanted. They got kind of ticked, actually. So they went back, and they said, all these tables that those glider people were giving us, those mathematical calculations, they're all wrong. So then they went back, and they, they basically spent the entire time still building a better glider, redoing the calculations in a wind tunnel that no one else had thought of doing before. So then they went out to Kitty Hawk, and then how about those small changes? They then had the ability to, to once they redid the, they did it correctly, basically, they did 250 flights, I think, around that number in one month because the, they'd go up and they wouldn't crash. So they could just immediately make a little bit more change, a little bit more change, finally getting um, their balance in flight. And once they did that, they're like, I can release, I can release early, I can release often. You know what? We're ready to throw a motor on it and fly, and that's what they did. Langley, Half-size model, three times. Half-size model, a couple more times. Let's ship it. And uh, you, you, we already know what happened there. Uh, let's get rid of the laser pointer and keep moving. Yep, he was almost ready. Challenge everything. Langley, he was almost done. Half-size MVP, ready to go. Just two features away. Uh, and as I said earlier, they crashed in 1901. They were kind of ticked off about it. So the Orville's biggest contribution to the project, were, well, there's actually two. First was building this wind tunnel and doing all the experiments with Wilbur. The second thing is he proposed the, um, the vertical tail. But in any event, Langley wasn't challenging anything. He just needed a bigger motor and a bigger um, glider. These guys got kind of ticked because it wasn't working as expected. And then evolve with the design. Well, I don't have to say it again. They were almost done. And there's the Wright brothers. Every year they went back with a bigger model. They challenged in 1901 before they got to 1902, and they, were get, they, they knew in 1903 they were going to succeed. The last one, and this is where we're going to go to in our language discussion. Langley was, was supposed to be doing this full time. And it's kind of ironic because Wilbur Wright said he was doing it only part time. But Langley was in charge of the institution. And every six months or so, he had to go somewhere to, you know, expose the world to American scientific knowledge. So in that period when they were racing, Langley versus the Wright brothers, Langley went to Europe once on a tour, he went to the Caribbean once, and he also went to Tahiti once. Nice work if you can get it. Meanwhile, Wilbur and Orville, they, um, they basically gave over their bicycle shop to their sister and Charlie Taylor, 
and they worked on that all, all the time they could. So they removed all the noise from their life. They didn't have parties like uh, Langley is doing. Um, so I think, you know, that, that sort of says something. So what does this have to do with writing software? Well, you can see, a couple years later, after Kitty Hawk, uh, the Wright brothers were in their airplane. They are flying a couple hundred feet off the ground. That's a very famous photo uh, of uh, Wilbur flying by the Statue of Liberty during a big celebration uh, in New York City, and Langley um, not getting his third attempt. Let me ask you this. When you write software, when you write software, are you doing one thing at a time when you're writing software? Are you evolving the design? Are you making small changes, et cetera, and et cetera? This last one's important, particularly for you um, C-sharp, full-stack, test-driven development folks. Um, I'm going to show you now what REPL-driven development will do. And I'm going to do some live coding. I know some of you are like already on the edge of your seats. Like some of you go to the stock car races to watch the crashes, and so I get that. Um, but I think instead of me just sort of talking about it and showing pre-built slides, I'm actually going to show you how it happens. So, um, and it, and it's a whole lot of fun. So the first thing I'm going to do is recognize that um, Microsoft at Build about a month ago said, "Okay, all you full stack developers." You better know the UI, and you already know your MVC over here with your JavaScript. You already know, um, you already know um, WPF and your Windows Forms, and you already know your Xamarin. We're going to throw another UI framework at you. Uh, it has no visual in, in, uh, components at all. Oh, I have to get out of Visual F Sharp and go to other languages. And yes, that feels good. Um, and you have to learn something about bots. So people familiar with bots? It's like the new way, a couple people are raising their hands. It's the new way of um, interacting. And, and, the, and the point of uh, bots are that um, you have a conversation back and forth, either in SMS or in Slack or, oh, it's not flipping. You know why it's not flipping? I minimized it. Uh, all right, well, screw it. I'll close it. How are we doing now? Th no. All right, go away. All right, here we go. Sorry, thank you, Jan. Uh, anyway, so here we are, and um, I, I, I wanted to do, and so when they introduced us at Build last month, they did a stock analyzer program in a bot. And it, curiously or coincidentally, about six years ago when, I, when they started rolled out F Sharp, in the first video I saw, they were doing stock analysis too. So I'm like, okay, so I guess everyone has to do it. So what I'm gonna do is, you know, bots are just another UI framework, so you could have a, Stock analyzer.mvc or a Xamarin one or, or an iOS and Android or whatever, but we'll, we'll just do a bot. And I'll show you it in action. It's easier for me just to show you than explain it. But as this template fires up, you might look a lot like a C sharp ASP.NET uh, Web API 2 project, because uh, that's what it is. There's a single controller. And in it, um, there, there's other stuff in part of the bot framework. There's a single method called post. Yes, it's a post. And you can see what they have, their boilerplate code. You get the length of the message, and then you return uh, the length of that message back. They also have this really cool thing called the bot emulator. So if I come over here and hit run, I'll let that spin on up. It's basically just spinning up a website in the back. Yeah, see, it's localhost 3978. And I'm going to come over here. Let me know when we're done. And I'll say something like, hello, world. And I'm going to send it to the bot. And the bot's going to say, OK, it, it talks in JSON. You sent 11 characters. All right, that's what you get out of the box. So now you're thinking to yourself, OK, that's kind of interesting. But um, what do I need to do to take this bot and give it really smarts, good smarts? Maybe tell me what the stock price is, in, is, is right now. Or better yet, tell me what the stock price is going to be tomorrow. Maybe I'll trade on it. Oh, and by the way, if you guys implement this and um, you guys start making money, please let PD, NDC have some money back, please. Um, they'd appreciate it. Um, so here we go. So I'm going to add a new project. I'm going to go to Visual F Sharp, and I'm going to grab a library. Um, and it's a stock analyzer. And I'm also going to get my cheat sheet. Uh, actually, I'll do it like this. One second, please. I had that open. I must have closed it by mistake. This is in Git, and we are in REPL-driven development. All right, good. I just have some references and whatnot um, that we can reference. So here we are in F-sharp, um, which has a REPL out of the box. I know C-sharp has a REPL. Um, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But for now, we're going to stay with F-sharp. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is delete all the boilerplate, all six lines of code, three of which are comments. Um, and, and now I'm ready to write in my script. You can see up here at the top um, is where I execute the code. Once I execute it, it gets sent down to the bottom part. If you're not familiar with the REPL at all, it's very much like the SQL Server Management Studio, the query analyzer, where you type select star from customer at the top, and at the bottom you get your results data. Are we conceptually okay? Once you see the first one, I think you'll be fine, um, if it's still a little bit fuzzy. So what I'm going to do is bring in some packages that I've already um, added references to. Oh, and let me do one more thing. I'm going to change the framework down to 4.6. Yep. And I'll wait patiently while it changes that. And I'm going to change the target 4.3. All right. So this adds. Let's just make sure we're working. And we are. So I'm adding some references. I'm going to f -sharp .data. Um OK. And so where I want to get my stock information, just like uh, control Z that, just like everyone else in the world, I go to Yahoo because it's free uh, for now until they're purchased. And so if you open up this URI on uh, finance.yahoo, you can see I have a historical data of stock prices, the date, the open, the high, the close, and everything else, and the adjusted close. And notice it's in descending. So the most recent date uh, yesterday is there. Um, and looking back at the code, um, oh, sorry. Uh, looking back at the URI, uh, you can see it's right there. I just picked Microsoft for no apparent reason other than I know Microsoft has data in there. So what I want to do um, is I want to do this. Uh, case sensitive, please. All right. Let's see if I resolve. Thank you. And then, you know, I'm going to copy this over just so you don't have to see me hunt and pick too much through it. But I'm going to go ahead and get the stock info here. And so in F Sharp, this is not a, a talk about the F Sharp language. There's plenty of those out there. But in general terms, I'm, the, the type is the context. Those of you who have done entity framework, you already know what I'm talking about. It sort of does the data definition of whatever data source you're at. In this case, it's a CSV file. And then here is, now get me an instance of it. And notice the URI is the same. That'll be changing soon. But now, now that I run this down here, I can, do some, I can see the data coming down like so. Uh, let me pop that open. You can see that um, we have rows of data, and they're a sequence kind of like your list in C Sharp, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and then you see the, the, the date time and the open and close and everything like that. So I just want the rows of the data. That's all I really care about. Now, I got this stock data and these rows of data, and I want the most recent one, I think. So I'm going to do something like this. I'll say stock info. OK. So I need the, I'm going to map, and I want the function of a stock info. I want the adjusted close. And then you know what? I only want the latest one, so I'll do seek.head. Pretty straightforward, right? If I run this like this, um, if I run this like this, and I look in the output, you can see that uh, $52.09 is the most recent close. And um, I should really make that a float. Yeah. OK, so I'm done. I now have a way of I've gone out to some data, and I've used a type provider, sort of made things life easy for me. And I've sort of figured out, OK, I've used a high order function uh, called map, and I've uh, gotten the adjusted close for all these things only. And then I've gone ahead and gotten the first one, which is July se uh, June 7th, and I've changed it into a float. I'm ready now to put this into production. So what I want to do is I'm going to come over here, and I'll call this um, stock provider. And um, because I'm a good .NET citizen, I'm going to call my type the same thing as my class uh, file name, which is very common in C Sharp, not so much in F Sharp. But anyway, and so this is going to become my managed assembly. And so the first thing I want to do is say get latest stock price. And I need a parameter, right, the ticker. And I don't want to return a function. Uh, I don't want to return a string. What I want to do is come over to my script and say, yeah, this works pretty well like this. And oh, yes, I also need the type there at the top. I'll take care of that in a second. I'm going to come over here like this, uh, like so. I have a second type up here. And then I have to open uh, f -sharp .data. Um <laughs> Oh, one more thing, please. 
uh, recent. Oh my goodness, Jamie Dixon. Excuse me for one second. Nothing to see here, really. Um, I thought they had this project all set up, um, ready to go, and so this will be one second while I navigate through some directories. I'm sorry about this. All right, there we go. Okay. Okay, so, so I have this, and you're thinking, okay, this is great, we should ship it, but in fact, what happens if someone passes in something other than Microsoft, like that? Any guesses? Well, it, it went quickly, I should really just pin the, the FSI, but you can see I'm getting a not found, right? And it's actually of type system net web exception. So what I really need to do because I can't control user input from my bot, or any, uh, just like any other web page. I need to do a try for now. And then um, uh, do a with um, a system.web exception. And I'm going to return negative 1.0. So if I see a negative 1.0, I know it's a failure. Everything else, I'm going to get a stock price. So I've now done my happy path, and I've done one, at least one common exception. I can build this. Now, you're thinking, well, I'm doing test-driven development, and even though I'm going out to Yahoo, I should be using a mocking framework. This is an integration. Um, bear with me. There's, um, I'm just doing this to show how we can add in um, unit tests and, and how it all works sort of together. I'm going to grab the tests. I'm going to bring this in. I'm going to add a reference. Guy's doing well. Uh, and then I'm going to go over here. I'll grab, uh, two, 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 I'm sorry, I need to go to my projects. And uh, oh, I've already made a reference. Look at me. Um, I'm going to go over here to the tests. And I'm going to grab one unit test. It's actually an integration test. We get this. But um, it, it'll demonstrate what I need to show, which is actually I'm going to bring two unit tests in. Our first unit test. Um, says, OK, get me the most recent price. Uh, control Z. Uh, control period. Let's get, come on, resolve this. Mm -hmm. I'm already analyzing it, so I just need the using statement. Uh, Visual Studio is not moving as fast as me. Let's try this at the top. You know, let's try this, right? It was chicken software. Doc stock analyzer. How do you like? Oh, semicolon. We good now? Come on. Oh, it's the wrong method name. Thank you. Who said that? Is that Jan? I said get latest stock price. It's actually get most recent stock price. Now we build it. Um, why don't we like this now? Get most recent price. Yeah, it does. So now if I run this, and I'm going to run the first one, you can tell I just said, OK, get me the most recent price and make sure not null is coming back. And the second one, I'm passing in garbage and expecting a negative one back. Um, this is an integration test. It's not a unit test. Um, that's not really the point. You, you, um, the point is to show you that how you can use um, your unit test projects written in C sharp and access F sharp assemblies and how you can move your, um, your code over from the REPL like that. Oop, did not like that. It failed. Mm, oh, good call. Thank you, Jan. Thank goodness you showed up. All right. Let's build that. And now we come over here. And now we need to run tests. And you can see that now we'll get our negative one back. Thank you, Jan. Um, OK, so you're thinking, OK, that's kind of interesting. Oh, and then finally, what I can do, um, I can go over here to my bot. I can go to the controller. And now that I have some decent uh, unit tests, I'm thinking, OK, everything looks covered. What I'm going to do is implement this. I'm going to ship it um, by putting this F sharp code in. And uh, I'm going to do it like this. Right, I go get my new stock provider. Oh, I have to add a reference, excuse me. Um, last time I should do that. I should have to do that. Yeah, stock analyzer. Um, the method name is wrong, as I remember. 
Oh, no, no, I changed that. That's right. Get most viewers in price. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it can't be found, or it's going to say your current price. So I run this. And then I'm going to come here, and I'll type in Microsoft or IBM or whoever. And sure enough, oh, can't be found. MSFT. OK, 52 bucks. My favorite stock prints, ticker price, foo. Um, oh, and, and I should also show you that if you pass in garbage, can't find it. And you're thinking, OK, this is kind of an interesting demonstration. What does this have to do with the Wright brothers? Now let's get serious with the, our coding and our iterating our thoughts. Um, we want to know not just what the stock is doing today, but we want to know what the stock is doing tomorrow. So that's going to take a little bit more advanced thinking. And we want to do it very easily, and we're going to do it quickly. So let's do it like this. I'm going to come on down here. I'm going to add in some references. And I'm going to say, OK. I'm going to load in F sharp job charting. And I'm going to say, OK. Mm -hmm. Bring this down. Thank you. I'm going to take this stock info. First thing I'm going to do when I do a chart, let's do a basic line chart. How about I'm going to say, OK, um, I, only, uh, I only need for the stock information, I only, uh, excuse me, uh, I want the date, and I want the adjusted close. And then I'm going to send this to a chart, and I'll even spell it right. And I'll do a fast, I think it's a fast line chart, yeah. And then I could do something like this. And so I can check out the stock symbol. And this is for Microsoft. But you can see, OK, eh, it seems to be going up. And maybe I could throw a log at it and stuff like that. But that's just not good enough. When I, when I see a line chart like that, I probably think, well, I probably want to predict the future. And I have these sort of dates. And maybe this is the best way is just predicting the date. What happened yesterday might be a good indication of what's going to happen tomorrow. Why don't I throw a, a regression at it? So what I'm going to do, and this is the last time I'm adding in references, the last time you have to see this notepad. Um, I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to bring in a, a package called Accord, which is a really phenomenal set of packages for doing basic statistics as well as advanced statistics. Um, so if you're a .NET shop and you're thinking about getting into analytics and machine learning and stuff like that, your first stop should probably be Accord. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy this in because in the interest of time. I'm going to go ahead and make my x and y variables look like this. So my uh, how about like that? Ah, yeah. So and this is just basically converting the dates into an integer that I can use, or a, a float I can use, and sticking it into an array and, and, and the y too. And so now. I can come in here, and I can bring in a regression. And when I run this, you can see that this, let me just make this a little bit bigger, that my regression ran, and that, uh, make this, slide this up a little bit, my R square, which is what I use to evaluate whether a regression is useful or not, is 0.78. And we're going to remember that number. The, uh, the root mean square error is $6 in either direction, kind of a wide range. Um, so I don't know if you want to trade on it. But, my, but really what we want to know about is tomorrow. So what should we do? Well, let's do this. Let's ask the regression what tomorrow is going to be. So I'm going to copy this over again um, to spare you my typing. And um, this will tell you that tomorrow the stock price is going to be 36. Well, wait a minute. That can't be right. The stock was at 50. Is it really going to drop $20 by tomorrow? Then I realized, well, wait a minute, I'm just running a regression on all these, all these stock tickers. And basically, I'm just thinking that it's going to regress to the mean. Yeah, maybe 35 is the average. But that's not what we want. Do we really think that the price in 1992 is going to influence our price tomorrow? Probably not. So let's go over here. And we'll say, hmm, what I really need to do is take maybe the last 10 days. Let's see how good that is. So I'm going to run this again. And OK, for the last 10 days, maybe I'm getting a little bit closer. Notice my root mean square error is 41 cents, so I'm getting a little bit closer to my range. But my R square is 
I don't want to use this model. What should I do? Well, well, if 10's not working, how about 20? Okay, let's try it. Well, there you go. Our R square is up to 54, so it's slightly better than a coin flip. And uh, yeah, tomorrow it's gonna be $51.14. Trade on it today. Um, so let's assume that we talked to our boss and we said, okay, that's good. We're slightly better than a coin flip. Well, let's put this in production. You say, sure, boss, I got this. I'm gonna go over to my compilable extendly. I'm gonna build another member. And I'm gonna get rid of the REPL now. I'm gonna say member this dot predict stock price. And I'm gonna add a ticker. And then I'm gonna add um, a target date. Something like that, right? So it's the date that we're gonna target to. Um, I'll use that try with again because basically we're going to the same data set. But in here, I'm gonna get rid of all this uh, code, go back to my REPL, or my script I should say, and I'm gonna say okay, for, uh, pretty much everything from here on down is good. Um, I'm gonna get this in here. Tab it over. Now this is gonna get rid of this. And Jan, you don't even have to tell me, but oh yeah, there's the ticker symbol. Oh yeah, now I need the Accord stuff coming over too, so let's go back into here. And we're gonna go into here. One more thing then. Oh, we're still running. <laughs> and I'm going to go uh, at the browse again. Uh, no, I actually have them all right here. One second. Uh, Accord, Accord Math, and Accord Statistics. OK. Hmm. So why don't you let me do that before? Yeah, maybe I was too quick with the, there we go. Hit OK. It doesn't, uh, oh, it's the wrong path, thank you. Who said that? I'll get you candy, a second. Uh, I'm sorry to do this to you then. Um, and OK, and then we'll have to browse a couple more. Accord math, accord, so we just need the accord dot statistics. Hit add, hit OK. Do you know, get out of here. Let's go over here. All right, we're building. Um, so now we have, uh, oh, this is going <laughs> to, one more. We need uh, system.data. Now, system.data should be in the GAC, so that should be, of course, it's not right there. Uh, I'll just go up the assemblies in the framework. It's right there. I'm sorry, guys. I did actually have this all prepared. And now I'm fat fingering it. Hitting OK. All right, so here we go. So now we build. Yay, we can do references. Um, so now we're predicting. Oh, and there's one more thing. Uh, instead of tomorrow being the date that I just sort of threw in there, uh, I'm going to get rid of this new date time. And... Um, pull in the target date. And we have to give the compiler a little bit of help. So this is in system.datetime. There we go. Uh, float array. Oh, and then this um, is also coming out as a, an array. So I have to change that to seek.head. Build it. Go over to my tests. I want one more test. Right here, where I just want to check. OK. Do I get the next date? And run the test. 
Yeah, so we're running green. Um, so, so you can see how I've moved from the REPL, and then I've moved it over to my compiled assembly. And then finally, I also can, if, if you're so inclined, and I have 10, 15 minutes left, I can then obviously have the bot tell you. Well, you might as well. You can't just finish it like that. We can have the bot tell you um, what the current price is and what the date is going to be. So I come down here to reply message. I'll get rid of this. Control V that. Run that. I come over here, and then so Microsoft now <coughs> is currently 52 bucks, and I think it's going to go up 73 cents tomorrow, just on regressing to the mean after the last 20 days of uh, data. Gone back and forth, sort of figured it out, pushed it into production. Um, this is an example, a trivial example, with a little bit of live coding, because I wanted to show you how it actually sort of works. I apologize for the references. But how you can sort of work that dynamic of working in the REPL until you finally figure out your happy path. And let's contrast that now to with how you would think about, um, I'm going to have to fire a PowerPoint again. We'll see if that fires over for me. Shift F5. Am I going to get it? Yeah. Um, so Sutherland tells you when you, and if we want to apply it to code, that we need to fail fast and early. And those are some examples of Alexander Graham Bell's idea about how to do everything in human flight. None of them worked. Um, but if you're in a test-driven sh development shop, a TDD shop, what do they tell you to do? First, if it's existing code, you have to extract an interface. If it's new code, maybe you don't need to do that. You create the interface. Then you go ahead and build your unit test class. Then you build your test method. Then you build your code over there. And you go back and forth, back and forth. And maybe you're using some tools like NCrunch and other things to sort of speed you on your way. But that's your iterative de development. And compared to the way you would write code and just ship it, and hopefully QA would find it, or ship it, and hope that your customers don't find it, or if they find it, this is faster. You're failing faster and earlier, because your QA, uh, or your trust of development, is finding things faster. But is it the fastest way with your current toolbox? And also, Sutherland tells you the really important thing about Scrum is that you need to co stop context switching, one thing at a time only. What do they tell you with test and development? You're in your test, you're in your code, you're in your test, you're in your code. They actually use the example of tennis like it's a good thing. Meanwhile, your brain is flipping back and forth between the two. So is that really what you need to do? The answer is no. If you just stay in your REPL until you get your happy pass and your unhappy pass and then just throw them over your unit tests, you have a way of working on only your problem at once before you need to go over to your unit tests. Now, why do you need your unit tests? Oh, and the next thing is that Sutherland says is working too hard makes more work. What percentage is the correct percentage for code coverage? What's the right number? Anyone? No, no, no one's answering yet. Someone's going to, any number? 100%? Do your property getters and setters need to have unit tests? No? Well, we're not at 100% anymore. 42. 42. Let me ask you this. Does 1 plus 1 really need to be tested? Like, are you really concerned that the add symbol is not going to somehow work for you? And all these things that are in there, uh, I, I want to show you one example of working hard. Here is some code. Right? Here's the data structure, right? Does any of that need to be unit tested? Yes or no? I heard a bunch of people say no. OK, what about that? Do I need to build unit tests to make sure that my min length is greater than 2? Do those need unit tests? People are saying no there, too. Hmm. All right, customer adjuster. Here we go. Here we have, uh, we're passing in, so we have to do our argument validation, because we're all good C-sharp folks, and we have to make sure that we're not having nulls coming in. And I'm assigning it to a local variable, and then I'm incrementing its property of number of orders. Does that need to be unit tested? Some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. OK. What about this one, analyzer? Again, the customer comes in, so I do a null check, and then I check to see what city they're in. And if they're in a certain city, I go ahead and um, give them a coupon, if not otherwise, some kind of businessy logic. Does that need to be unit tested? Everyone's saying yes. And then, OK, so for the last one, does that need to be unit tested? Some people are saying yes, like plus two is important. OK. Um, this is what I think. I think you need a test on that null ref, because you're in C sharp, and you, you might have a null ref, and it's good to know. And I think everyone agrees that you should definitely use the, the, the coupon one. And so you, I'm using mock. Um, 
but you, you definitely need to mock out to, to do that. So that's my code coverage is 10%. If I was in a shop that said you need to have 80% code coverage, what's that remaining 70%? It's just working hard for no apparent reason. And I'm sure if, as professional software developers, you've been in that situation where you're just sort of churning out this code because some project manager thought it was a good idea to have 70 to 80% code coverage. Some people are shaking their heads. Um, so Sutherland's telling you, knock that all off. And so this is what I'll tell you, REPL driven development, it doesn't solve you. You still have to have a conversation about the right level of code coverage, but you don't have to go through the, the, the mechanism of creating these tests and going back and forth because you're just pretty much doing the important business logic in your REPL before you send it on over. Um, and let me shift five this. So why do you need unit tests? Well, you do it because you have to make sure you're right. You want to make sure you're change proof, right? So if someone else in the code base changes some things in the, the code under test and your unit tests start throwing red, you know you've got a problem. And the serendipitous effect actually when a lot of .NET developers started doing unit tests, if you remember back then, was you know, it's really hard to unit test void. Um, so people started writing in a more functional style just because they needed to start working about return values so they could start doing unit testing. Um, and that sort of forces it here. So what, the cost, though, is that you do have a lot of code and a lot of noise. And that context switching is occurring. And suddenly I'm telling you, that's not really what's going to, that's not what the important thing is. That's not why you should be coding. So why do you use the REPL? Well, you can be correct in the REPL, and you can have those, four, those testable methods. But it doesn't really protect against change. The REPL code, in my mind, is a lot like those architectural diagrams. I mean, you still need to do architectural diagrams in the beginning. Anyone um, who's doing Agile will tell you that. But you just don't spend a lot of time doing the beat off, the big design up front. You do a little bit of change. And then you um, go ahead and you write your code, because the code is the important thing, right? The code is the, the reality. That's the canon. Everything else is sort of noise. Um, when you have these, when you're doing it in the REPL, that's almost like a step above, the, or the step, next logical step from your architectural diagrams, because you now have sort of proved out the idea in code, which you can shift over. And what should you do with those scripts? Should you keep them? Some do. You might want to throw them out. Because once it's in production, once it's in compiled, you need that protection, protection against change, and the REPL won't give it to you. So you need to sort of think about using both your REPL as proving out your ideas as fast and as early as possible, moving over to your unit tests, and leaving your unit tests there as a way of change proofing your code. Just an idea. So there I am. There's another way of looking. I know I do great graphics. You're in your REPL. You throw your unit tests and your, uh, your, your code under test. And then as you iterate, you stay with your, unit, uh, your code under test. Now, if you want to think about a new idea, you certainly go back to the REPL, and you can add a reference to that compiled assembly and keep working on it and then bring it back. The last thing that he talks about, and this is my only slide where I talk about the language per se, is that um, Sutherland thinks it's really important that you remove the noise and the clutter. And if you're C Sharp developers, uh, you really think it's important that you have intention revealing names, right? That's like line one in Uncle Bob's clean code book, et cetera, et cetera. And most of you, I would argue, probably have ReSharper installed and you use it. In fact, you think uh, Visual Studio is a plug into ReSharper. Um, <laughs> Why do you need it? Um, and, and also, when I did that file new, did you see how many files were created? Why do I need all that stuff? And, and is there anything underneath that I really should know, or should I just stay with it as magic? Um, I don't have the example. Uh, um, I have an example I want to show you uh, real quick. But my answer to that is this. You need to listen to really smart individuals who have worked down this path before about why you need to learn F Sharp. Um, the first is Jan Tui, who is actually right here in our audience. He does a talk on ineffective coding habits. In fact, he gave it two nights ago. Um, if you haven't seen it and you're a C-sharp dev, you, need it to, you owe it yourself to go and watch that talk um, because you're going to nod in agreement about 95% of the time. And you will start thinking to yourself, wait a minute, there is a different way to write code, a more effective way. I will now be faster and more effective. Um, the other thing is, remember I was returning that negative one because I wasn't doing structured exception handling. That's not the way to do it. Um, there's a guy named Scott Voshlin, who's also another awesome person that you should follow. Um, in his blog, F Sharp for Fun and Profit, he talks about railroad-oriented programming. And I want to show you, particularly on that second one, one more um, solution in Visual Studio. Um, and it's called uh, 
the, the proper and improper way. Now, I, I'm not doing Scott justice by any stretch, and I'm not showing you a solution, but I want to show you the problem or an idea. So if we're going to ship this code and we're going to put it in production, we, here's a data structure. Do I need XML code comments on everything? Do you? No? But it's publicly facing. C Sharp will tell you you have to. Framework design guidelines, you absolutely do. Um, well, so maybe you need them, maybe you don't. But what about structured exception handling? We all know, for, you know, Abrams and Shawala, right? We need a single um, exception based on our namespace. So in this case, it's called customer processor. Uh, and it's an exception, inherits from exception. And then I have other exceptions. And in this one, I'm inserting some data to a database. And then I'm also uh, notifying some people via email. So I need that insert customer exception because I want to insulate it in case I switch from SQL to Oracle, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to throw a, a SQL exception or a SQL client exception. And there's a notification. So when I do it improperly with no XML code comments and no um, anything else, I go to the config file. And then I go ahead and uh, insert that, that customer that came in. I do some validation and I do some stuff going in. I still think this is pretty verbose, but there's 77 lines of code. To do it correctly, to do it correctly, um, you do your argument and validation, of course. Then you start doing your tries, your tries, your catches, your catches, your tries. Let me know when you stop, when you can stop and you can actually see the working code. What line was it? There's only three. All that noise is in your way and you absolutely need it which is why you need to look at railroad-oriented programming, because Scott makes a phenomenal case about taking that clutter and all that noise, you need it, it's not going away, out of your head while you're trying to solve the problem, and then sort of adding it at the end. So I would strongly encourage you, or I, to encourage you to, yeah, let me uh, put that one up again. Da -da 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 -da. I, I'd strongly encourage you to, to check out both those blog posts. You, you, you owe it to yourself. And with that, I think we're getting close to the end. Um, I put all this code on GitHub, and I just sort of blew through, and I didn't really give um, REPL-driven development like all the different iterations you can do justice, but in uh, interest of time and also watching me code, it might be painful for you. Um, but go ahead, and if you want, you can hit me up on Twitter or on, on email, and I'm happy to discuss it with you. And I encourage you to come to the functional hour. Brian, is it next tomorrow at 1? So after lunch every day, come on down. I'll be there. Jan will be there, uh, Evelina. And, and all the F Sharple group will be there. And we'll, we'll work through your domain-specific problems if you're interested in it. And we can try to help you along. On Monday, when you start writing code again, do a file new F Sharp project, open up the REPL, and see if you can solve your problem doing that, and then lift it over. You might be surprised on how effective you really are. And with that, thank you all. And let's go get some dinner, I think. Is it that late at night? Yeah. Thank you all.